Okay, fellas, let's get a little paranoid. What's your favorite conspiracy theory? All right, so Tom may already know where I'm going with this. I don't think Kyle does. But picture this. The year is 1985, and it's the NBA draft. Now, the year before, 1984, was one of the most notable NBA drafts. Uh, Jordan gets drafted that year. Barkley, John Stockton, and uh, Akeem Olajuwon is the, uh, the number one pick. And that, that year, as every year before it, uh, the team that gets first pick uh, was decided by a coin flip. The Houston Rockets won that year. Now, the next year, Commissioner David Stern changes the lottery system. Uh, so now, instead of it being just a coin flip, uh, they're going to put envelopes in a big uh, bingo roller, right? And David Stern will pull out an envelope, and whatever team's logo is on the card inside that envelope, they're going to get first pick. And this is televised live and everything. And by a sheer miracle, the Knicks were the team pulled. And that meant they got to draft the number one pick, the one that everybody wanted, which is Patrick Ewing, who was a, a star uh, you know, coming out of college. Over the years, there has been serious thought that David Stern rigged the draft because the Knicks desperately needed Patrick Ewing and the NBA desperately needed a good team in New York. Uh, and now, Kyle, you're not a native New Yorker, but Tom can attest uh, it would take a conspiracy in some cases to get a good team in New York uh, for basketball. But um, the prevalent theory of the conspiracy is that Stern actually had the envelope with the Knicks logo uh, dipped in liquid nitrogen and frozen so that he could reach in and feel which envelope was cold, know it was the Knicks, and be able to pull out the Knicks logo. Uh, what's crazy is if you watch the video, Stern does stick his hand in and kind of fiddle around inside there and then pull out the Knicks envelope. Now, another theory suggests that the accountants who were in charge threw one envelope to the side uh, when they tossed it in the, the spinner, which bent a corner and Stern felt for the dented corner. But so that for a long time, it has been this conspiracy theory that Stern rigged the 1985 NBA draft so that Patrick Ewing could go to the Knicks. And what I love about this most uh, is that it, it's one of those things that the more that when you first hear it, you go, that couldn't happen. Like that's ridiculous. And then the more you find out about David Stern and especially the NBA in the late eighties and early nineties, you become more convinced to the point where uh, a bleacher report did a story on this interviewed Patrick Ewing and Patrick Ewing went, I don't know if Stern called me up and said he rigged it. I'd believe it which I love. So that is, my, that is my conspiracy theory I subscribe to. I truly believe in the frozen envelope. So uh, the, the one that I do subscribe to, I mean, it's, it's like kind of the basic bitch one. I mean, it's the JFK assassination. I mean, there's, I don't know. It's just, it not, I mean, it's not even like, oh, you got to do all this deep, deep research into it to like think something's up with it or like become as obsessive and uh, sweatily attractive as Kevin Costner to like think, oh, there's something going on here. It's just like, well, no. This weird little gremlin man who went to Russia and then came back and could was like apparently an awful sniper in both armies wasn't gonna hit these two unbelievable fucking shots in a convertible going like away from him at an angle like it's just at, at, with a single bolt action sniper rifle no it, then and then this is a case of like the more you do dig into it the more you just go okay i mean there's something seriously more going on here i mean i am i for one really do think it was honestly kind of what was laid out in the irishman which is that uh the mob and the CIA were working together, and because JFK was fucking with the mob and the CIA's work, they had him taken out. I mean, I think uh, that's kind of where I lay with conspiracy theories, because, I mean, that's one's just, like, on the front, it's like, this is not, this doesn't make sense, and then the more you dig in, it's, yeah, this weird little man did not shoot him. And then that Jack Ruby fucking assassinates Lee Harvey Oswald as they're walking him out of the police station on TV, like a little 
fucking like a bar bar owner, strip club owner, whatever the fuck he was, who was tied to the mob, just decides to like show his patriotic pride by gunning down the guy who was president, who was very whose brother was anti mob. Come on, it, no, no, it, no, not. Not once, not ever. Can we try and uh, start a movement to create a conspiracy theory around one of the other ones? Uh, can we try and say that Charles Gateau didn't really shoot James Garfield? Can we start that theory? Um, you know, uh, Leon Cholgosh innocent. Like, can we try and launch that one? Settle in for a quiet afternoon with your special someone who you're trying to make look like a different someone because you don't know that this someone was just pretending to be that someone to begin with. We're talking 1958's Vertigo here on You're Missing Out with special guests Sean and Carrie McCabe. Our guests today are the hosts of the podcast Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie, a show about everything unexplained, unbelievable, and just plain weird. Joining us today are Sean and Carrie McCabe. Hi. Hello. That's a new intro for us, Sean and Carrie McCabe. Yeah. We'll start right with that. Um, this We're recording this prior to you guys getting married, but it will be released after you two get married. So yes. we're, we're kind of jumping the gun a bit here. Yeah, through the magic of podcasting, we'll, be, we'll <laughs> become married. I think that's great because you guys occupy a unique space. You know, we've had... A couple of uh, couples on the show before. We had one who are engaged to be married. We had another who are married. And you guys are um, the Schrodinger's betrothed who are occupying <laughs> both spaces at the same time. Mm -hmm. Things could exciting. still go very badly. So uh, who knows? It is 2020. Yeah. You know, the leftovers might just happen. And if there's anything I've learned from years of 90s television, it's that weddings always involve wacky hijinks. So. Uh, that's true. I actually have two weddings booked, and I'm just trying to make them both work, uh, changing clothes in between. Oh, what an interesting way to find out that Sean is Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> interesting for you. How do I feel? I don't know. How do you feel? Let's get into this. Let's get into our feelings about Mormonism. Well, Carrie, it's, important, <laughs> it's important to note it's not that Sean is two different people. He's the same person. He just changes the color of his hair from time to time. Well, see, uh, Sean doesn't know... It. He's two different people. It's like that hit Christian Slater show, My Own Worst Enemy. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so for anybody who's who's wondering and maybe wondering that this is already taken on a much more casual tone than our episodes normally do, um, <laughs> Tom and I have known Carrie. Um, I was I was literally about to say Carrie Ferrante, so I'm already not. Uh, wow. I have. Okay. I, we have to do that for me, too. <laughs> um, we have known Carrie for over a decade now, we all went to college together. We have a rapport, and uh, and Sean uh, fits right into that rapport really easily, which is a great relief, because I was very nervous uh, when I first met Sean of like, am I gonna, uh, am I gonna just come off like the biggest uh, asshole, um, which I had a, a uh, reputation for being even back in college. So, well, chances chances are you did, but he still, yeah. you know, was he nice did, to you. But he enjoyed it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so excited to have you guys on, especially because you guys do have this podcast, Ain't It Scary, which I love. I really do um, love this show. You know, I'm I'm not just doing a you know with this new show we're doing. I was very careful about. It. I didn't just want to bring people on because we were pals. I wanted to have a reason. And the moment I heard the first episode of your show, uh, I immediately messaged Karen. I was like, you guys have to come on. I love this. I want to talk about this and promote this uh, any way I can. Uh, Ain't It Scary is, is great. And Carrie knows back in college, I was known for being very blunt. If I didn't like something, so you know that praise is sincere. Oh, yeah. I knew you would, AKA you would tear it a new one if you didn't like it. Uh, lovingly, but still. Uh, we've done dueling movie reviews of each other's college films so i know mm -hmm. how that can be some <laughs> but i'm glad you enjoyed it i i am yeah yeah I, I listened to the db cooper episode and uh i gotta say it's uh it's really good stuff uh interesting listening to a show with two hosts that actually like each other because i don't get that experience <laughs> every um um not but, a degree, but, but there we go. Yeah. <laughs> for, for now, we're starting the show right at the start of a marriage, so it'll be kind of an interesting... Uh, <laughs> a marriage during a pandemic. <laughs> it's it's going to be... It's literally going to be 
the the Scarlett Johansson Adam Driver meme, but it's the two of you arguing about whether the headless horseman was real. The eighth year of their marriage is just going to be the eighth season of the X Files. Robert Patrick shows up, <laughs> Sean disappears. Yeah, isn't the eighth anniversary the Robert Patrick anniversary? <laughs> <laughs> it is it, it is the it is the t1000 anniversary that is correct yeah paper uh brass and then robert patrick's in there <laughs> it's uh so for folks who don't know, it's it's a great show it's this perfect like blend of the dollop and lore it's it's a really great thing and i really wanted to have you guys on for something that kind of fit that theme but and there's nothing explicitly horror in the first batch of films in the registry and it would be kind of weird to sort of go, hey, your show's about uh, conspiracies and paranoia, so what are your thoughts on Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans? Like, it would have been weird, you know? <laughs> Got any crazy, creepy stories about Nanook of the North? And, yeah, it wouldn't really play. Um, but Vertigo is this perfect little, like, paranoid thriller, and I thought we could have a lot of fun with that. Um with you guys on so i'm very glad you guys agreed to come on for that uh for this it's i think it's gonna be a lot of fun yeah Absolutely. thanks for having us yeah to get into it i'm gonna start by reading the registry statement so this is why the national film registry said they selected vertigo few movies thrust its viewers into the heart of erotic obsession than alfred hitchcock's vertigo that's hang on i want to take that again that's what they wrote there's a weird typo in here <laughs> 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 Few movies thrust its viewers into the heart of erotic obsession than Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. This okay. is a very, so you can't you can't connect like sentence it. with then. I'm if liking the find, usage of thrust in there. Find me find me a jury that will tell you you could say that and I'll go down on you. All right, um, let me just take that again and I'll just I'm just gonna plow through it. Um, just plow. throw the word more in there. I think they yeah more. yeah. <laughs> okay, let's do that. Thrust um, and plow. <laughs> more. I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting flustered over here. <laughs> oh, this is a loose one. Okay. Um, <laughs> now I'm getting hot and bothered over here. <laughs> Enough with the well, loose one. Well, at least right. you got a wife next to you. <laughs> Few movies thrust its viewers into the heart of erotic obsession more than Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. As Jimmy Stewart pursues mystery woman Kim Novak, whom he transforms into the image of the dead woman he loved. Hitchcock paints a vivid picture of the consuming and harrowing nature of desire. Stewart, a police detective debilitated by the dizzying effects of his acrophobia, is shown as a man free-falling into love in a thrillingly and surprisingly compelling performance. Novak exhibits a slinky feline grace and alley cat passion in a mesmerizing dual role. The dreamlike images of this romantic tragedy are so eerily beautiful they become indelible in the viewer's minds. Upon its release, few people considered the film Hitchcock's best. Many of the director's films were tenser, scarier, spine-tingly entertaining. But over time, Vertigo has percolated into our collective consciousness and is now cited by film scholars and viewers alike as the greatest film of all time, displacing the previously perennial champion Citizen Kane. So that's why the registry said they selected Vertigo. Now there's some uh, trigger words from back when we were in college uh, with Carrie, which is the invocation of both Hitchcock as a revered <laughs> filmmaker and Citizen Kane, um, which if you go to film school, it's kind of hard, I think. And this is something Tom and I faced going into this. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure since we all had the same classes, Carrie did too, which is it's almost hard to appreciate Hitchcock because there is such a reverence for him in the film school crowd. Oh my God, dude. It's, it's like, I, I, cause I've even talked to some of my friends that went to film school so it's not just like a post thing. It almost seems like film school was created just to make you want to <laughs> kick the, the negative of the 39 steps into an incinerator. You have, it's like you have to watch that every other week because it's like every class is like, oh, do you want to know how to make film? You need to watch the 39 steps. And I'm like, just like, like by the fifth time, I was like, can I just... Can I just dig Alfred Hitchcock up and kill <laughs> him again? Yeah, so it is hard. And and also, you know, Citizen Kane is, is so hyped. And you kind of run into this thing where it's 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 like dealing with the Beatles, where if you were not raised a Beatles fan, uh, when you see the hype around it and how much people deal, you know, play these songs over and over and over again, it's very easy to kind of be like, oh, they, you know what? Actually, they're not just not great. They suck. They're the worst band ever. They're so and such hipstery stuff. 
And then you kind of come around to the point where, you know, it's it's almost undeniable. Like you you can't really argue that Citizen Kane is a terrible film or that Hitchcock's a bad filmmaker. But it's 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 easy to kind of become jaded to it when you're exposed to it too much. So I want to kind of start with Sean, and I want to know, Sean, what is your relationship to Alfred Hitchcock as a filmmaker? How how much have have you seen, or, or what, what are you a fan? How, what's your relationship to Hitchcock? So uh, I grew up with a dad who found it very important to show us the classics. That was his version of the classics. So like, you know, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein was in there, but uh, <laughs> but 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 there were also but there were also some Hitchcock uh, films that it was uh, important that we see. Um, but that was like Psycho and The Birds, which you know I don't, I, I don't like The Birds now. Uh, and I didn't yeah. like the kid. Um, but, but I had to kind of uh, find the rest of Hitchcock myself as I went along. I've seen a lot of Hitchcock, certainly not uh, all of it. And here's a confession time. This is kind of exciting. This is the first time I saw Vertigo. I'd never really? seen this movie before. Wow. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's fine. I mean, I, I don't think I, I mean, I, I don't think I, I saw Vertigo probably four years ago the first time. I didn't see it like immediately. Because Tommy watched the... it in college. I didn't watch it in college. <laughs> I sat a table away from you. No, you didn't, because I never saw Vertigo. I think you fell asleep. <laughs> no, I I didn't. I must not have been in class that day, because I didn't see Vertigo. All right. Um, now, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the bird, Sean. I wasn't going to cop to this, but we'll give a little pull behind the curtain for people. Um, this is going to be our first public episode, uh, Hitchcock episode of the show. But we have actually talked about Hitchcock before when we were trying to figure out, is this concept of a show going to work? Uh, we decided to do a private practice show, just me, Tom, and Kyle. And we said, let's pick a movie that's on the registry that neither of us like and see if we can actually bring ourselves to talk about it academically and talk about it and like find why it has value, even if we don't like it. And Tom immediately went, we both don't like the birds. And I went, yeah, okay, yeah, let's do that. So I I feel you on the birds. The thing about the birds, and and if we can get to Hitchcock just a little bit, is that it it, the birds does kind of come at the tail end of what is almost a miracle run for Alfred Hitchcock as a filmmaker. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things that uh, it's almost like, well, to bring up the Beatles again, when people talk about great the greatest Beatles albums. And sometimes something like Magical Mystery Tour gets lumped in there, despite being kind of a weird one. Uh, (laughs) But it's just because it's so much easier to just say, oh, this stretch of six records are all perfect, than to have to go, well, in between there's a weird one. And if you look at Hitchcock's filmography, you know, eh, people kind of tend to, to lump it. I mean, you've got the run he goes on starting with I would say, I mean, Rear Window, Mm -hmm. To Catch a Thief. Mm -hmm. Um, Then there's The Trouble with Harry, which is less well-received, but... I do like The Trouble with Harry. (laughs) Uh, So fair, that's fair. Uh, But so Rear Window, To Catch a Thief, The Trouble with Harry, The Man Who Knew Too Much. Then the only little bump in the road is the Henry Fonda film, The Wrong Man. But then Vertigo, North by Northwest, Psycho, The Birds. When you have that kind of a run, where the only one of those that does not have like the staunchest defenders is the wrong man. And the only reason that that is not a, uh, does not have staunch defenders is that even Alfred Hitchcock himself doesn't defend that movie. <laughs> I, in, in the book, uh, if, if you guys have or haven't read it, um, which we'll probably be drawing from a lot tonight between Tom and I, is the Hitchcock Truffaut book, which is when Francois Truffaut uh, sat down with Hitchcock and interviewed him about his films. Uh, Truffaut keeps trying to get Hitchcock, Hitchcock to defend the choices he made in the, making the wrong man, and Hitchcock just keeps going. I don't know, it was Warner Brothers needed me to make the film. They they needed me to paycheck. And in the end, you know, Truffaut says something like, "Well, I just think you know the film. If it had uh, been more of a documentary, if it hadn't had your style, you could do all this." And Hitchcock goes, "All right, just uh, we'll just consider it a failure then." And <laughs> true, and Truffaut goes. I was hoping you would offer a defense of the film. I was hoping you would defend it. And Hitchcock goes, I don't care enough about it. <laughs> so, well, well, 
his own attitudes toward his uh, his body of work is uh, pretty you know indifferent at times. Um, but Vertigo is one that he definitely he, he thought highly of. He enjoyed making. He put a lot of effort into. It's adapted from a novel, a French novel that Truffaut implies was written with the intent of, oh, Alfred Hitchcock might want to make this. The novel that the the author had written before was made into the French film um, Diabolique, which Hitchcock had optioned and then failed to get. So they came up with this other film or this other novel, which I have the title, but I'm I'm part I'm a little afraid to try and butcher it. Um, <laughs> but it's a uh, you know. Uh, so they made this film. Uh, this, uh, they wrote this novel, and uh, Hitchcock opted it. And very quickly, he kind of realized that this would require a lot because there was so much psychologically that he wanted to get into with it. Um, oh, here we go. It's 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 um, uh, d'entre les morts, which is from among the dead, is what it's called. Uh, and Hitchcock apparently almost kept the title from among the dead before settling on Vertigo which I think is interesting as well. But, uh, yes, this is, so this was something that he, he really, uh, he dove into, uh, he had a lot of, he was very particular and precise about every little thing from the production design to bring in Edith Head to do the costumes because every single color on every single jacket had a specific purpose. So he's very meticulous about this. And then, uh, as was mentioned in the, in the registry blurb, wasn't overly recognized in its time and has now come to be what a lot of people consider um, now the greatest film ever made. In fact, it was after decades of the famous sight and sound poll naming Citizen Kane the greatest film of all time, uh, in the most recent sight and sound poll, uh, Vertigo dethroned Citizen Kane, which I think is an interesting uh, development on that one. Probably because Vertigo is a lot hornier. It is also, yeah. It's... Hornier than Citizen Kane. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yes. Everyone online is just horned up. I, 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 think, I think Citizen Kane will probably end up uh, reclaiming the title in the next poll, if just because Citizen Kane now feels uncomfortably prescient. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, it's very, it's, but it is, it is a weird thing. And I, I don't think, you know, and I, I, I remember we even had a, we had a professor who said it like, Look, I don't think there's really that many people other than the real, you know, film hipsters who are going to say, oh, Vertigo, you know, Vertigo is in fact better than Citizen Kane. But it is this rise in kind of recognizing Vertigo is not, it's it's a different kind of movie than Citizen Kane because Citizen Kane is a film about a story that, you know, or I say, it's a film that's about story and telling a story and it uses expressionist elements to tell that. Whereas Vertigo isn't really a plot movie there is a plot but in terms of hitchcock plots it's definitely a lot more stripped down than what we're used to it's all like all the plot is happening out off the screen like it's such a typical noir plot but none of like we're not following it it like all happens at the end where you go oh well this is why all of this happened because the husband wanted to do this and blah 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 and you go oh so a lot of shit was going on but <laughs> James Jimmy Stewart just didn't know. <laughs> but when you watch his other films, like if you watch Man Who Knew Too Much or um, or Foreign Correspondent, so North many of his movies West. that deal with like, yeah, there's there's a million things and it's just this, it's this chaotic thing of like, oh, and but this, but then this, and then you thought it was this, but then it was this. And actually there was this old woman who memorized a song and the song was a secret <laughs> code to get the spot. And it's just like, there's so much. And Vertigo, comparatively, is pretty stripped down because it's not really about the story. It's it's a movie about obsession and about paranoia, and it's more interested. And Hitchcock acknowledged this to Truffaut. Uh, he said that it was more about... He was less interested in the story. He was more interested in the, in the visual language of it and making you feel this paranoia and obsession. Now, with your show, guys, you have dealt with... Po let's say possibly real obsessions. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, some of these obsessions are real. It's just uh, it's the subject of the obsession. You real. did a you did a well no, but I mean even you did an episode. Um, that by now it'll be months old, but I encourage folks to seek it out. That I thought was fascinating because I'd never heard the story before about the uh, 
The Watcher, right? Is that the... Of Westfield, New Jersey, yeah. Yes. That was the one, uh, you know, I remember listening to that and kind of... I, I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. I was driving, listening to it, and then I got where I needed to be, and then just circled around the lot for a little bit to finish that one up. It was. It was a very, you know, it's fascinating little story. So you guys have dealt with that, and that that this idea of obsession, um, which is what this film taps into. And I was just kind of wondering. So, so from your point of view, because of course Tom and I come from maybe sometimes a little more. Literally, Tom is certainly more of a uh, a story oriented guy when it comes to films and you know plot driven, and and maybe I lean a bit more on the abstract and the expressionist. Um, but you guys can come at this from a different angle, which is of course what you guys deal with with your with your show and these ideas of paranoia and obsession. And I, I guess what I mean is is there's a way to look at Vertigo which is just going, well, that would never happen. That's implausible. What are the odds a nun would pop up here? There's a way to look at it from my angle, which is a lot of times it's just, I don't really care. Like, this looks cool and this is, you know, and I feel the tension of this. But w- the whole thing that you guys do with your show is kind of take that leap of going, yeah, but what if it did? Like, what wouldn't it be cool if it was ever, What would that be like? And I feel like this film is very much in that in that lane. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about that. We, we definitely agreed that if... Uh... I think we agreed that if uh, if they had made a go with this relationship and uh, uh, Kim Novak hadn't fallen off of uh, uh, the church for real that spoiler time. Spoiler alert. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> I think we can just spoil that, right? Yeah. Um, you, you can indeed. We Go go crazy. J- Jimmy Stewart would have ended up murdering her at some point. If not there, right then. Yeah, well, that was there, the end of the book. Really? The end of the book, instead of her falling out of the, the, the bell tower, he chokes her to death when he, he like he figured he like when he figures out what she did and how she tricked them and all that he just straight up strangles her to death you, you know i probably would have been i don't know i don't remember whether i said this to you already or not carrie i would have probably been more satisfied with the ending of this movie if he had pushed her off of that roof or strangled her to death just chuck now, her right out of the fucking window now <laughs> now regardless of your opinion on the film sean if i can give you some advice as a man who is about a week away from getting married, um, I maybe wouldn't uh, say I'd be more satisfied if her betrayal was responded to with murder. <laughs> Much well, more satisfying if she oh, dies in a brutal to, death. To be clear, I don't think she would have deserved it even necessarily. I, I think that that's where Jimmy Stewart's obsession seemed to be. I think it was leading him down a murderous path, and, and I, I would have been satisfied as a viewer to, to see it go there. Sure, sure. Kyle filed this under Exhibit A. Anyway, um, (laughs) Sean just told us everyone he is the stepfather. (laughs) No, it's it's I I see I I disagree because I any of the changes that were made from the book to the film sound fantastic to me. Uh, My favorite is my really Mike. My favorite is that I didn't realize, and and again, it's something that Hitchcock talks about with with Truffaut. And I'll see if I can pull the quote here. Uh, if you give me one second, I have a, I have a, uh, this is full of post-it, uh, notes in here. Cause it's, you know, if it's, if it's old crotchety French directors, uh, <laughs> I, I enjoy it immensely. And if it's um, fat old men that don't give a shit about anything, I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Hitchcock was discussing, um, the idea of the note, right. Mm-hmm. And having her write uh, the note, because he says, you know, uh, let's see, I've got it right here. The story, meaning, you know, the book, uh, the book is divided into two parts. The first part goes up to Madeline's death when she falls from the steeple. And the second part opens with the hero's meeting with Judy, a brunette who looks just like Madeline. In the book, it's at the beginning of that second part that the hero meets Judy and tries to get her to look like Madeline. And it's only at the very end that both he and the reader discover that Madeline and Judy are one and the same girl. That's the final surprise twist. In the screenplay, we used a different approach. At the beginning of the second part, when Stuart meets the brunette, the truth of Judy's identity is disclosed, but only to the viewer. Though Stuart isn't aware of it yet, the viewer already knows that Judy isn't a girl who looks like Madeline, but that she is Madeline. Everyone around me was against this change. They all felt that the revelation should be saved for the end of the picture. I put myself in the place of a child whose mother is telling him a story. When there's a pause in her narration, the child always says, what comes next, mommy? Well, I felt that the second part of the novel was written as if nothing comes next. Whereas in my formula, the little boy, knowing that Madeline and Judy are the same person, would then ask, 
And Stuart doesn't know, does he? What will he do when he finds out about it? In other words, we're back to our usual alternatives. Do we want suspense or surprise? We followed the book up to a certain point. Uh, but do we want suspense or surprise? Now, I loved that specific bit. Do you know that the studio didn't want him to have that? Like, they filmed it and the studio said, we don't want that in the movie. And he fought and fought, but they did test screenings. One version with the scene in, another version without it. The version without it tested horribly. The version with it tested well, and that's why it's in the movie. So I think, uh, as usual, Hitchcock was kind of right on the money with this one. It, it's so much more interesting. Well, it's uh, his bottom under the table thing. Yeah, yes. And it also adds an element to when you're getting to, you know, if the if the movie, the second half of the movie was just us watching Jimmy Stewart obsessively make over a woman who kind of looks like a dead woman, you'd be like, oh, he's crazy, and I have no, there's no tension to it, you know? It's just, it's the suspense equivalent of watching Jason slaughter kids at a camp. But because you know that that she is Madeline, that her awkwardness and discomfort at being made over isn't just about the, you know, his obsession, but it's, if I do this, he's going to figure it out. He's going to be onto the plan. It's also just a technical thing. I mean, it's a movie, so, like, we're going to already just immediately, and I was like, oh, that's Kim Novak. Yeah, she looks exactly like Madeline, because that's Kim Novak also playing Judy. So, like, we kind of can't play it like it's a, a, a book where they're writing around, oh, it's actually Judy. What? It's like, no, that's her. That's, you know what's, that's her. You know what's funny when you say that, Tom? Do you know who didn't know that that was both Kim Novaks? Uh, Ten-year-old Mike Natale <laughs> did not recognize, like, that I, she looked just from the way that, because all she's doing to change from Madeline to Judy is it's the hair, and she also, she changes her posture so that she her... She Clark Kent. Yeah. She changes her posture, and she's got a, you know, her, her chin looks different, and so I just, I remember when I watched it, I kind of thought at some point they switched out the actresses. Like, I didn't realize. Oh, well, you were also 10 it. years old. That's I what mean... I'm saying. But it, but I mean that as in, like, it is remarkable how Kim Novak does find a way, and you mentioned the Clark Kent thing, that Kim Novak does find a way to make Judy and Madeline distinctly different in her performance. Yes, and when he when he changes her hair color and uh, and he's like, no, it's still not right. And then she goes into the bathroom and then she comes out um, as Madeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can you can see the difference, and it's not just the hairline, right? She's she's doing something. She's doing something. That's mm -hmm. for sure. I think it also knowing that secret as an audience puts us in the position that Scotty was in initially, which is that he's watching and he's, he knows something she doesn't know, which is that he's there. And we know something he doesn't know now. So it's like all of these layers of just watching and knowing and, and waiting. And as an audience, we become the, you know, the Jimmy Stewart stalker voyeur because we're like waiting for his reaction to this. Um, so it's very interesting how it, it kind of forces you as a viewer into that perspective, even if you don't realize it. And it's, you know, Sean, I, I, I hate to go back to the book again so quick, but uh, of course I have to. Uh, Sean, you mentioned the scene when she comes out of the bathroom with her hair and, you know, and that, that great moment that there's there's initially like a fog on the lens that gives her this ghost-like aura. Well, Hitch, uh, Truffaut had an observation on that. Uh, Hitchcock started by saying, uh, the basic situation of the picture is that cinematically, all of Stewart's efforts to recreate the dead woman are shown in such a way that he seems to be trying to undress her instead of the other way around. What I like best is when the girl came back after having had her hair dyed blonde. James Stewart is disappointed because she hasn't put her hair up in a bun. What this really means is that the girl has almost stripped, but she still won't take her knickers off. When he insists, she says all right and goes into the bathroom while he waits outside. What Stewart is really waiting for is for the woman to emerge totally naked this time and ready for love. To which Truffaut says... That didn't occur to me, but the close-up on Stuart's face as he's waiting for her to come out of the bathroom is wonderful. He's almost got tears in his eyes. Uh, and Hitchcock says, yes, at the beginning of the picture, Stuart follows Madeline to the cemetery. We gave her a dreamlike, mysterious quality by shooting through a fog filter. 
that gave us a green effect. Uh, and he goes on to say that when they shot at the hotel, it had a green neon sign so he could bring back that same ghost-like quality to it so that there is both an air of death and an air of eroticism at the same time, which is an interesting parallel to draw. Uh, they mentioned that in the Hitchcock Truffaut doc, and uh, they show clips of that scene. And yeah, it's pretty clear when you have that in your mind, because when she walks out, it's the like a medium of him, and he's like sitting down, and he slowly stands up, which is, uh, you know, I mean, he's getting erect. I mean, come on. He's not, he's being as subtle as he can be because it's 1958. So, I mean, yeah, he, she finally took her knickers off and Jimmy's ready to go. And uh, they also <laughs> meant, because well, they also mentioned in the doc that it's at that point, he finally like has something work out for him in the movie. Like she, he actually got her to look exactly like Madeline. And that's like the one time in the movie where he has a win and he's like feels good. Yeah, because we don't see him really prior to the incident that essentially gives him the vertigo. We start in media res with him running across the, the rooftops. Now I want to say I want to pull one last thing from the book uh, because I want um, Sean and Carrie's response to this, which I'm going to read one more thing from the the Truffaut uh, interview with Hitchcock, if I may. Um, Francois Truffaut. It seems to me, because uh, Hitchcock was saying how he had difficulties working with Kim Novak. And Truffaut says, It seems to me these unpleasant formalities make you unfair in assessing the whole picture. I can assure you that those who admire Vertigo like Kim Novak in it. Very few American actresses are quite as carnal on the screen. When you see Judy walking on the street, the tawny hair and makeup convey an animal-like sensuality. That quality is accentuated, I suppose, by the fact that she wears no brassiere. Hitchcock. That's right, she doesn't wear a brassiere. As a matter of fact, she's particularly proud of that. Truffaut. So before shooting North by Northwest, that's that's how they <laughs> stop talking about Vertigo. <laughs> that is... Oh, I mean, Alfred. he also inserted a lot of... I assume this isn't from the novel. He inserted a lot of bra Real talk right weird. at the top I, of the movie. I, I have tried. I searched desperately. I promise you guys, I searched desperately to try and find, like... What is the symbolism of that? Yeah, because because you're like, yeah, every jacket, every uh, color patch on every jacket is uh, it means something. It's like, you, what's the bra conversation? Why is her bra on like a radio antenna also in front of her art easel? I fucking dug, guys. I promise you I dug. I have a note here that's like, there's. There, I'm sure there's some symbolism to his gal pal being an underwear designer, but what is it? I kept Googling, Googling the only site I found that even talked about this was, quote, I, this is their name, lingeretalk.com. <laughs> well, anyone's going to so, talk about it. Which <laughs> I pulled this, this quote from them, which is, the classic filmmaker had an almost fetishistic fascination with lingerie, but he couldn't understand it as either functional garments or fashion items. Instead, he turned underwear into a symbolic emblem of shame, the viewers, Moral failing, the characters, and frustrated libido, the directors. What I love about this is the idea that Hitchcock just didn't understand the point of lingerie. <laughs> As a functional garment. Um, you know, it could be that Jimmy Stewart's standing, it, it could just be, you know, that this is something that presumably would get Alfred Hitchcock's attention, right? Uh, this, this bra talk. Um, but it doesn't get Jimmy Stewart's attention. It doesn't get Scotty's attention because yeah, Midge is just going on about Midge stuff and uh, he's got to move on to the next thing. Well, maybe it's supposed to, to kind of emphasize how like not about Midge he is at this point. Uh, she's literally waving lacy underwear around and she's an underwear designer, which, you know, you'd think that would be like, ooh, sexy. She probably has a lot of spare items around, but... He's just so uninterested in commitment, um, especially with Midge, who is, frankly, throwing herself at him. Um, Poor Midge is just waiting to get she's all vatted. That's what this... Yes. There's an alternate timeline where where this movie ends with her just getting a makeover and they go to prom. Like, that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's kind of... It's sad, but it, it really does underscore the fact that he's just not interested. 
Well, I, I think it also maybe kind of also like what you guys are saying that, you know, Midge is throwing this kind of throwing this in his face and he's not interested. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Scotty likes women that are kind of unattainable. I think that's kind of what they're setting up. I mean, he goes for a woman he's on who's he's under the assumption is his friend's wife. And then he obsessively like is looking for this dead woman to so much so to the point he finds someone that looks almost exactly like her because it's her and then tries to change her into into his dead fling he's a man who cannot be satisfied with anything that's real or tangible or like legitimate i i think that's kind of why it's symbolic that he's got vertigo it's like he just he he's always got he's always reaching up too high and he falls and you know what that brings to mind for me and it's it's a, they're two radically different films but that whole dynamic, even when it starts out, that that the reason that he knows about Madeline is, oh, it's this, it's it's the woman that his friend is seeing, and he says, just follow her around for a bit. It made me think of another movie that is essentially about a main character who will never be happy and only goes after the unattainable. Uh, it, which is uh, Woody Allen's Manhattan, is essentially starts with the same kind. It's a totally different plot, but starts with the same kind of setup of. You know, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> true. But like, but that Michael Murphy kind of turns around and, and goes, "Hey, can you just? I'm I'm having an affair. Can can you just like take her out sometimes so that my wife isn't suspicious?" And then because he can't have her, um, he wants her. Isaac wants her and and covets her. And then once they're together, it's a mess, and he immediately wants to go back to the high school student that he was seeing. Because she has this air of the unattainable, and it's all just about this guy who will never be satisfied. And that is ultimately the real plot of Vertigo, is it's not about a guy trying to kill his wife and all stuff. It's about a man who cannot find satisfaction and is caught up in obsession just trying to chase what he thinks will satisfy him that he can't ever really have. Because that was Hitchcock. Yeah, I mean this movie. This movie's very much like, maybe not self by like an autobiography because uh, I really doubt Alfred Hitchcock lived the events of Vertigo. I, I don't think he's ever run up a flight of stairs. <laughs> Sean, I think Sean, you beat me to it. I was sitting here going, "Is it is it cruel if I say that?" And then you got there. Thank you. Okay, I, this, uh, happy to be of service. I, I mean, because yeah, I, I mean, yeah, this is very much a movie about some weirdo who likes to watch women from afar and is kind of this ineffectual almost like impotent cuck who's yeah. like who who just gets all horned up for blonde women that he really shouldn't be until he goes fucking crazy and is trying to like constantly recreate this thing he can't have feels like the most self lacerating of Hitchcock's movies I mean until he straight up makes Anthony Perkins murder a blonde in a bathtub, but you know that's yeah. you know. so. So in a way, the other connecting tissue of Vertigo and Woody Allen's Manhattan is both of them use that film to let us know who they were right off the bat. Just really <laughs> let us know what they were about. Well, I think the um, difference is this is what like forty years into Hitchcock's career, like what thirty years because he was doing yeah. Silence. So this is like thirty years into his career. This is Woody Allen, like. Oh, 10 years of movie making. I was a writer for Sid Caesar and everything. People are starting to think I'm a good filmmaker. By the way, I'm a fucking creep. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, Rock, he was known for basically tormenting his actresses, many, if not most of which were, were cool, aloof blondes. And so many moments or themes in his films are just about voyeurism and watching um you know from like anthony perkins in vertigo like spying on uh janet lee or you have literally rear window which is all about that um you know the director is like the ultimate voyeur and he just keeps on replaying this theme um, I think he he just he can't escape it. It's like it's just this. It's conscious. It's subconscious. It's he, pathological. It is pathological. Just like this character is, uh, Jimmy Stewart's character is like kind of out of his mind. 
Oh, completely. <laughs> like, just a little bit. There's, I think it's kind of why, because I mentioned this to Mike uh, yesterday in a text, that Hitchcock had this, like, at a certain point, had this weird run of these movies where he just keeps casting main ma- male leads that are way too old to be playing the characters as written. Like, Jimmy Stewart looks like he's 60 years old, and it's almost written for him to be, like, 38, maybe. <laughs> uh, you know, North by Northwest, Cary Grant looks like the world's most spry 70-year-old man. <laughs> <laughs> it, it almost feels like Hitchcock is casting these older men in these roles because he sees himself in these roles, and he am, he is an old, weird man constantly watching women from <laughs> afar, and... About, and like in this movie, berating them and torturing them until they become the perfect little plaything that he wants them to be. And then when they are, he, you know, fucking tosses them away. I don't know if you got to this in the book, Mike, but they mentioned it in the documentary that uh, he originally wanted Vera Miles to play yes. the Kim Novak role. And in fact, Vera Miles was the model for the portrait. Well, yeah. And I mean, he, he said, I we did screen tests with her and they have pictures of her in the screen test in that outfit. But he says... She got pregnant, so we couldn't use her. And I forget the exact words he says, but he, yeah, he basically goes like, yeah, she was useless after that point, now that she was a mother. Yeah, that's, that's, where the fuck is it that he says this, this deranged fucking maniac that he is? Because she's um, no longer sexually viable as a mother rather than, you know, the the young, sexy lady. I mean, it's, it's going from a poor to Madonna, which, uh, is kind of ironic nowadays but uh you know he's he's just completely uninterested even if she's the same actress she was before um if she's not sexually and and psychologically viable to him then there's no point in working with her the quote here is uh hitchcock did do you know that i had vera miles in mind for vertigo and we had done the whole wardrobe and the final test with her Truffaut didn't paramount want her hitchcock paramount was perfectly willing to have her but she became pregnant just before the part that was going to turn her into a star. After that, I lost interest. I couldn't get the rhythm going with her again. I mean, it's wow. it's yeah, it's so funny though because like you tell that story of him like r- like talking about uh, the 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 letter scene, and he r- talks about it as in this metaphor of a of a little boy hearing a story from his mommy, and you go, yeah, dude, you you really have some shit going on with all the women and moms and like blondes and shit because you you got I, it's like wow he would be fucking canceled today with how it's obviously a, he's a creep it's also wild in the book <laughs> it's also wild in the book uh because that's the point where Truffaut pushes back on him a lot because Truffaut is obviously a huge admirer of the film and loves as most people who watch film loves Kim Novak's performance so he just kind of keeps pushing back at Hitchcock like okay and at one point he says all right, but people who can remove themselves from the situation, anyone will tell you that Kim Novak's exceptional in it. Hitchcock just keeps going, she's fine, it was nothing. And Truffaut is clearly getting a little irked by this, which I love. Well, this is uh, four years before the legendary torturing of Tippi Hedren on the birds. That's like 62, right? So, like, I mean, he's done this his entire career of just treating blonde women like absolute dog shit, but... I feel like the one everyone talks about because she was not quiet about it was Tippi Hedren. And that's all and that's also because I think part of the reason that gets talked about too is not just cuz she spoke about it but because after that the yeah, that's the birds is where Hitchcock takes an obvious dive. No dive. Cuz after that it's Marnie and Torn Curtain and Topaz mm. And then the one that is um, the ultimate uh, bonk go to horny jail meme movie frenzy. Um, <laughs> what a picture! Uh, oh, what a, embarrassing! It's <laughs> it's so weird. Um, but it's it's funny because you kind of see like so the themes. Yeah, I mean, you know, some of the themes in Vertigo are present later in Frenzy. But the thing I think is interesting is the other element of Vertigo, which is about the obsession, especially obsession with a dead woman especially obsession with a woman and trying to make another woman be the dead woman take the place of that one is obviously also an element in the only best picture winner hitchcock had which is rebecca mm-hmm. uh from 1940 um which is a sim it's, it's obviously from a different point of view uh rebecca is of course from the uh point of view of 
the you know the the main woman whereas uh vertigo mostly plants itself in the point of view of Stuart. we talked about this carrie and i um is it i think it's in Stuart's shoes pretty much except for the letter scene the whole way right which is why i love the letter scene it, it that's the one thing I, I truly love with this film because i part of the reason i can't I, I i have difficulties with vertigo when i think about it like when i haven't watched it in a while and i'm like oh vertigo is that there have been so many imitators so many films that think oh i'm gonna do a vertigo and what they really do is they do the male obsession and they do oh blonde and brunette even somebody i like even like david lynch who i i love as a filmmaker but like even when he trots out the blonde and brunette in lost highway i'm rolling my eyes and <laughs> and, and de palma and all that because they kind of miss the point and despite the fact that hitchcock um has some very misogynistic tendencies in his films the fact that he does at the point where it's necessary for the plot, he does give us a look into Kim Novak's state of mind, colors the rest of her performance so brilliantly, because otherwise we would just be watching a movie where we're going, this poor woman that Jimmy Stewart is mistreating and trying to force her to be somebody she's not. But what we see, because we know that she is ready to give up the scheme to him, but then she decides not to, not just because she doesn't want to get caught, but because while she was pretending to be Madeline, she developed real feelings for him. So you kind of have this element um, at the same time as having a, a, a thriller going on, you bring in an element that shows up in most rom-coms, which is, oh, I pretend that I'm somebody I'm not, but now I really like them, so how do I, how do I square that circle? And so when you have the moment of him with the dresses and he's so cold to her and he's like, no, not that dress. It needs to be this one. This is the color. I need it to be gray because of that letter scene and what Kim Novak's bringing to the performance. We know that it's not just, Oh, why is he being so cold? But there's elements of, Oh, he's trying. He must have really loved. Like it's, it's very clear that he, he must have truly deeply loved the woman. I was the woman he met, which was me. Because I was being me just under a different name and a different hair color. So, oh, that's very endearing. But also, he doesn't know that that's me. So now I know he's capable of this level of cruelty. It's it's just there's in that one scene in the in the dressing room, you know, and and he's talking about the shoes and she runs to the mirror. Like it's there's so much in that. Can I can I push back on the letter scene for just a second, Mickey? Sure. Because. Get him. <laughs> no, no, it's just that it's the like, maybe, right? Maybe that gives us a look into Kim Novak's head, but only in that one scene. And so that I, I don't know, it almost put in sharper relief. The fact that it was there almost put it in sharper relief for me. How much we're not in Kim Novak's head like it, that that scene feels like it's there to get us that exposition, right? To get us to halfway to the end of movie reveal. Um, well, and to, and to give and to answer any, you know, logical questions you'd have of, of, of well, why is she putting up with this now? Well, because she fell in love with him. So it gives us all that. But I. It just felt so, I don't know, uh, jarring to me uh, as a viewer, like, oh, I immediately know why we're seeing this scene in her life and no other ones. It's because this is the one that is relevant for us understanding what's happening. But see, well, I. I I think, I mean, as we talked about that, that wasn't in the book. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was, the, the reveal came in a different place. I think it was the idea of, I mean, look, the, the film is a very different film uh, if we are getting an even-handed back and forth of both of their points of view. I think that the fact that it is from Stewart's point of view, um, you know, is what gives the thing, the movie the sense of mania because it's... You know, it's it's a lot less interesting if you're dividing your time between uh, the person who thinks they're going insane and the people who are um, trying to make them go insane. Uh, you know, because in that case, you just get collateral beauty, which is uh, <laughs> the only time collateral beauty will come up on the National Film Registry podcast. I'm willing to bet, but yeah, you you, you would lose that bet. <laughs> but but I think that 
we don't I, I guess I, I kind of feel like to me we don't necessarily need to you know and I'm not saying you're doing this but like we don't need to measure the amount of time someone's on screen or the amount of lines somebody has to determine how much agency a film gives them or how much of their point of view we get and I mean we see that all the time to, to bring it to another paranoid thriller you know uh, Hannibal Lecter is barely in Silence of the Lambs but we still kind of treat that movie as a two-hander I think that the letter scene works because you can't give that information any earlier in the film. For the for the story to work, you can't know any sooner that Judy is Madeline. For the- hey, I, I, I did think about this. What would happen? I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you. I, I, what would happen if the audience just saw that the first time? What if the audience saw... Um, fake Madeline, you know, Judy run into his arms and then, and then a uh, uh, real Madeline get thrown off of the roof. Right. And then Jimmy, we know Jimmy Stewart thinks that she's dead, but uh, I mean, the, you know, the, that death was only real for us for like 10 minutes as it was. So I wonder uh, if you could have made that change. Well, because I think that if you do that, it's like Hitchcock saying when he says to Truffaut, the difference between suspense and surprise, which is something that I think when we deal with films today, a lot of filmmakers kind of forget that element, which okay. is, in horror movies. What'd you say? Like jump scares in horror movies. It's a cheap scare. Or even twists in horror movies. I mean, you know, the, the idea of... I, I, I think about, you know, and, and to give you an example, one that I don't, a movie that a lot of people like that I don't, but something recently like Hereditary, where the movie is about... Spoilers for Hereditary, everybody. Um, <laughs> the movie is about this boy who is slowly being... Uh, made a vessel for Paimon, the demon, in this cult. And the movie doesn't give you any of that information. It's just like drips and drabs of like weird moments and harvang moments. And then in the final five minutes, he sees what's happening and you get a monologue of, you see, your sister was going to carry Paimon, but then this and Paimon, blah, blah, blah. And it's just five minutes of exposition at the end that reveals it. And I think about, sure, the movie would be, I, I don't think that that movie should start with somebody saying, so, hey, that kid, we're going to make him the vessel for Pyman. But <laughs> I think that when you do it all at the end, it feels too much. And Hitchcock does this in some of his other movies. When you do it all at the end, it becomes, look at how smart I am. I fooled you. I tricked you. I did all this, which is something that people accuse even somebody like Christopher Nolan of. The opposite is to bring your point, Sean, when you say, um, what if you knew from the beginning? Or you know what? Or what if we knew earlier on she ran into his arms? Um, to to bring this film back up, Alfred Hitchcock's frenzy does that. Yeah, Alfred Hitchcock's well, I seen frenzy. What? I haven't seen frenzy. You don't. Don't. It's okay. bad. it's quite bad. excellent. Um, but it's so essentially the movie is about the premise is okay. What if there is a guy who uh, happens to be. Uh, at the you know involved with all of these women who end up getting raped and murdered um but even though the police are after him he's innocent and it's an innocent man on the run and that film could be compelling if oh this is the one with Harrison Ford right <laughs> uh close close uh you know roughly the same thing except there's no one armed man but that but that's the thing it's this it's this element of you know with with frenzy he's he's on the run now that film is maybe compelling if you and the audience are sitting back and going, I don't know if he did it or not. And then halfway through or somewhere around there, you find out, Oh, he didn't do it. How's he going to get out of this one? Because it changes, it changes where your, where your suspense is in the film in suspense, but it changes what you're in anticipation of instead of just trying to put together a mystery with frenzy from the beginning, it shows you, no, 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 it's not him. It's actually his friends, the killer. So there's nothing drawing you into this film. Right. But what draws you into this, though, is is his... It's like Hitchcock said himself, right? What comes next, mummy? Yeah. It, it's the... Uh, it's We have to know that she's alive in order for, uh, you know, us to know how crazy James Stewart is being. Well, of I course. think... I think we needed... I think we needed at that, t- at that moment because we needed to... We, as the audience, needed to know exactly how... Jimmy Stewart was that character Scotty was feeling. We needed to be in his shoes. We needed to see him freaking be out out on his 
out of his mind for a year. We needed all of that. We 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 didn't need because if we knew anything wasn't exactly what it appeared to be, we would already be going. Well, I don't know. I think something's going on here. It would maybe lessen the impact. I think that scene is is important because I do subtly think at that moment the movie does shift to her perspective because from that moment on we're in her sh- we're watching it everything through her eyes we're watching everything scotty does through her eyes and it also does this thing of it makes us know that she is genuinely trying to do something for this man because she loves him and she is trying to help him so every time she keeps digging herself in deeper and deeper it it feels more genuine because we now know, you know, like, okay, she is in love with this guy. And even though she knows what's going on is fucking psychotic. That moment where she goes, my hair, you want me to change my hair, don't you? And she, she starts getting frantic. She knows. I think it's, I think it all needed to come at that point. I do think Hitchcock does have a big problem in all, in most of his movies of, having a character stop in their tracks and explain everything to you. <laughs> but so I think, I, and I, I agree, like what Tom's saying to me is, is is also the idea of, if we had just seen her run down to him and the bodyguard that we knew then, then we're always ahead of them. We're always ahead of the people in the film. We always know more than them. What's great about getting the reveal when we get it is that we, the first time we're watching it, we, just like Stuart, believe that Madeline died. And then we have a moment where we see Judy and we go, oh my God, she looks like Madeline. What could this be? We're trying to put together the puzzle too, but it doesn't drag that out for the whole film where it gets exhausting or you figured it out by then. You get that moment and it waits just long enough. She writes the letter. We have the rug pulled out from under us. We know what it feels like to have had the rug pulled out from under us. And now we we can say to ourselves, oh, how is he going to react when he experiences what we just experienced? And there's also the element of it would be different if it was told in a flashback, and it would also be different if it was um, the husband calling her up and going, now listen, make sure you don't tell him that we did X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. This is more than just exposition because you get to see her write the letter out of a sense of guilt, but then take the step back and decide not to give it to him and decide, no, this is the path I am going down. And it is her essentially, she had an opportunity to get out of this and she doubles down. And that is what both of these people, her and Stuart have moments in this story where they could have backed off and instead they double down and they choose their fate. It's it's the bomb under the table. I mean, it's it's it switches the perspective. It switches the motivations. It switches our allegiances because from that point on, we are seeing Scotty as oh, this dude's fucking weird, man. This dude, like, there is something going on with this guy, and we know now having that perspective of seeing him for an hour and twenty minutes as a guy we kind of saw. And kind of like sided with we were like we were on his side he wasn't too creepy at that point but then having that switch the bomb is planted under the table and we know because now we're seeing her and we're now seeing how fucked up he is we now know because he is a fuck up like not in like a comical way like oh he's a drunk or whatever but like things just don't go his way so we know this is going to end badly and I think it's a pretty, for as much as we can give Hitchcock shit for these moments of he puts in his movies of just stopping in its tracks and just explaining everything to you. I think it is probably the best he's ever done it. It's the most graceful. It's still a little like wonky and just like, okay, I mean, yeah, we're doing the exposition thing here. But I think it's a little more graceful than he usually is because I just watched North by Northwest for the first time. Uh, two days ago and that movie has like five scenes where people just stop and explain everything to you and we just like i i know this i'm like i'm watching the movie i'm not an idiot yeah i think it's really obviously um good that it's 
Jim, Jimmy Stewart for so many reasons because he's uh, un- unbelievable in in Vertigo. Uh, but uh, I think especially that an audience comes in with Jimmy Stewart, I think already with warm feelings, right? You, you, oh, you already yeah. have warm and fuzzies down in your own Jimmy's uh, when Ew. you see that guy on screen just uh, being a favorite uh, war hero dad. Well, and can we can we have a moment? I, I just want to take a moment to do a little uh, Jimmy Stewart sidebar here because while the progression of Hitchcock is interesting, uh, Stewart's progression is, is also fascinating. So you, you know his last film, right? Five Goes West. Yes, of course. He's Wiley <laughs> Burke. Of, of course, of course. Mike knows this. The cartoon theme, f- Sean, theme park freak. Not only do I know this, this is not the first time Five Will Goes West has come up on this show. So, uh, if you ever, if it ever makes it on the on the AFI list, you got to have us back on. It was my favorite <laughs> when I was a boy. Well, that would be interesting because we're doing the National Film Registry. So, oh, well then. Um... <laughs> We'll tell you what if it has the if it comes on the AFI list, just have me on for a special episode. That's fine. That's what. We'll do. <laughs> um. So before Hitchcock, Jimmy Stewart had essentially been to invoke a name that'll make Kyle ring the bell. Uh, he had essentially been like an Arthur Lake type. He was a cute enough, charming fella, and he was just doing things like navy blue and gold and vivacious lady, and Capra, uh, casts him based on seeing navy blue and gold and seeing him as an all American boy type casts him in his best picture winner you can't take it with you uh because of that stewart suddenly gets a new uh lease he is now the all-american boy right and he is doing shop around the corner and philadelphia story mr smith it's a wonderful life and then he kind of starts to take a turn the same year he's playing a lawyer trying to clear a man's name in call Northside 777 hitchcock puts stewart in rope which is Hitchcock's um, experimental one-take film, Hitchcock's first color film, where Stewart plays... Uh, fake one-take, right? It's like zooming yeah. into a trunk for six seconds yeah, while you change reels. it does the and... bird <laughs> But, you know. Um, but Stewart's character is playing a mentor to two murderers, right? He didn't mentor them to murder, but, you know, he's doing that. And Stewart would continue to do these little charmers and westerns like Destry Rides again, but Hitchcock, every step of the way keeps subverting Stewart's image more and more so that when you get Rear Window, he's a bit more of a creep. And Man mm-hmm. Who Knew Too Much, he's he's a bit more of a weird obsessive. And then finally ending with, with Vertigo, wherein he is absolutely warping and playing off of everybody's perception of Jimmy Stewart the same way that something like Road to Perdition asks you to <laughs> grapple with Tom Hanks, who had a very similar trajectory to Stewart. One other thing about Stewart that I find fascinating, Carrie, I'm I'm assu- there's a chance you might know this film. Maybe not, and if not, find it tomorrow. Do you know this is not the only Jimmy Stewart Kim Novak film that comes out in 1958? Isn't it Bell Book and Candle? Yes it is. There we go. Yeah, of I had a I feeling that movie. I was in the That's- play. <laughs> <laughs> it's at- there's a movie with with Jimmy Stewart Kim Novak Jack Lemon and Elsa Lanchester about witches I figured if anybody has seen it that's an, that's an interesting film <laughs> and it's it's weird because it kind of is in this in Vertigo it is a taut thriller about obsession and paranoia where Jimmy Stewart essentially forces a woman to love him uh, <laughs> and to be the woman he loves and then Bell Book and Candle is a charming romantic comedy where Kim Novak forces James Stewart to love her. Yep. <laughs> it's very weird. And Bell Book and Candle is also the last, like, charming rom-com role that Jim Stewart ever does. So that whole portion of his career comes to an end at the same time as Vertigo. I, I just think that's so bizarre that the two of them do two movies in the same year and they could not be more different. Yeah, they are, they're wildly different. And Bell Book and Candle has this whole, like, hipster like 50s uh beatnik kind of vibe to it too that is very strange to see on film um and is yeah very very different than what you see in vertigo it's so funny that um the kind of relative failure of this movie uh a lot of people and hitch himself put on that uh jimmy stewart was too old he looked too old for the movie and people didn't buy him in the role and he uh, kind of fucks him out of starring in North by Northwest. He basically strings him along until he's signed on for another movie. He's like, ah, damn, we're about to shoot North by Northwest. We can't use you, Jimmy. And then 
shit talks him for being too old in Vertigo and they never work together again. But he cast fucking Cary Grant North by Northwest. <laughs> like, Hitch, what are you doing, man? He, Ca- Cary Grant looks like he's two inches away from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's kind of this weird version of, of uh, Vera Miles being less viable to him. It's like, well, now he's completely twisted his image to be just totally against type. And um, and now he's too old to basically play Hitchcock stand-in. <laughs> so it's kind yeah, of this I, uh... weird ego thing of like, oh, we have to get another another older handsome man to play me i couldn't imagine jimmy stewart just do it, having to do that airplane sequence he looks like he would just fall over and 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 just <laughs> cry <apart. laughs> yeah, he, he would he would just fall apart like a scarecrow and <laughs> sort of a, just poof <laughs> now there are other people we need to talk about because we have talked about stewart and and novak and we've talked about hitchcock but there are some other names that are are uh, impossible to ignore when it talks about when we talk about this film midge well, okay, besides Midge, who is, uh, you know, uh, the greatest bra designer in San Francisco. Um, loves, Sean loves Midge. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big Midge fan, yeah. Can we make it headcanon that Midge is just like the is the ancestor of Barb from Stranger Things? Because they have a very similar energy. <laughs> yeah, um, what about Midge? What about- she, she looks like Diane Weist. Is that just me? <laughs> I can oh, see yeah, that. Totally. I can see Diane Weist. Um, okay, so the other names that we need to talk about, um, Robert Burks, Saul Bass, Bernard Herrmann, which is Robert Burks' cinematography, uh, Bernard Herrmann's phenomenal score, and Saul Bass's title designs. I mean, the, the, there are elements of this film that are indelible and just so precise and perfect. You know, I mean, that that opening sequence which uh you know when when carrie was watching this she texted me a shot of the screen with the the type homage to un chan andalou the the salvador dali louis benwell film which i think is great yeah i agree <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I agree with you there i'm trying to rein in rambling too much but um <laughs> but that opening sequence i mean there's something about and of course Saul bass has done a number of great title sequences but there's something about the way that it closes up on the mouth and then the eye and the way that it just, you feel tense in that close up on the eye, just watching it dart around. Like you automatically start wondering who is, what is she afraid of? What is happening? Like right from the get go. It's, it's very unsettling. And I mean, it, it's a, it's a great comparison to Unchi and Andalou because, you know, you see this like, grotesque image in that film and i think when you're so close up to someone's face like that especially the eyes which are such a vulnerable um thing i mean it's like you know eyes and and nails and teeth like those are the things that really get you in horror movies so i feel like when you're close up on that and you're just forced to watch um it almost feels like you're anticipating something bad happening and you know, and you're thinking about your own eyes and like, it, it's just, it's, it's really unsettling. And I think it's, it's like a primal instinctual thing, but he really captures that in, in there to the point where you, you just start off the movie feeling uncomfortable. It's also not the only Un Chien Andalou homage in the film because, and it took me a minute. Uh, I, I didn't pick up on it first, which is I'm watching the film. And of course you've got that great Bernard Herrmann score. And great I'm text- Yeah. And I, I literally texting Tom going, I swear to God, something else used this score. Because it's that, that crescendo, that ba na 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 And I kept saying, like, what the hell is it? It was bugging me. And finally I realized it wasn't that I'd been watching another film that used the score. It's that Bernard Herrmann borrowed that, a lot of elements, but especially that crescendo moment from Tristan und Isolde, the, uh, the Wagner opera uh and when bunuel would screen unshan andalou he would play that same portion from tristan and his old so that great cue that great crescendo that plays when uh you know when madeline when judy reveals herself as madeline and all that that moment that is that is also lifted from unshan andalou this this um nightmare surrealist short 
from from 1929 by Bunuel, which is I, I think even that adds to the terrifying dreamlike nature of this movie. Who do we have to thank for the um, weird dream sequence animation uh, in the middle of the film? That I believe is is that also Saul Bass? I believe that's Saul Bass. I believe so. Yes, I, I think, think I think I also saw this was the first uh, Saul Bass title, you know, all titles uh, cr- sequence that was made used with the help of computers. Wow, that like the primitive, uh, you know, he giant he, punch card computers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, I think I read that uh, somewhere. That sounds about right because um, fifty eight. I guess those things were starting to get used in. Uh, you know, other, you know, businesses and industries. I mean, I know it's a big part of one of Mike's favorite shows, Mad Men, them wheeling mm-hmm. them big bastards into the office. But um, God love it. I, 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 I just love uh, the the look of this thing. The Saul Bass title se- sequence is great. The, um, the, the dream sequence, Mind Melter in the middle is great. Uh, Bernard, Hor- Bernard Herman's, ma- you know, he's, he's one of the greats. Um, I think he's, you know, he's definitely the, he might be the best uh, composer to come out before, like, Ennio and John Williams started taking over a uh, soundtrack, but uh, I, I love what he did here, and it really does more than I think any movie Hitch has done, is really just unsettle you from the jump, mm-hmm. because, like, not even Psycho is like that from the jump, because Psycho is, like, lulling you into this false sense of security, like, Oh, it's a noir movie, but then it like crashes into a, a serial killer movie where this is just like no, something's off from the jump, and everything about it is just perfectly like getting you to that place. And there's little things too. Um, like I noticed this time watching it, the editing in some scenes is intentionally off rhythm. Yeah, like that when when Stewart and Novak are talking, um, it cuts too slow between them it's almost like it's like when you're doing a like a zoom call or something and it takes a couple minutes before the person speaking shows up on screen like stewart we're on novak and stewart will always be like a part of the way into his line before it cuts over so that you feel yourself sitting there going no you're what what do you show me him like it takes you a minute you feel anxious there was one point in the movie where there was an incredibly slow dissolve to black it wasn't even to black by the end of it. It just cut. It was when they were in the... Oh, yeah, shop. just it, it, it was slowly dissolving down, and then it didn't get all the way to black. It just hard cut? Yeah. Yes. And it's... That's, super- that's weird. <laughs> yeah. And it's great. It's, it's, it all exists to unsettle you. I mean, the dialogue, not that this is necessarily one of the most quoted films in cinema, but just the fact that there's lines when Judy is pretending to be Madeline and she's looking at the tree trunk and has that line I there I was born and there I died it was only a moment for you you took no notice like that's haunting that is a deeply upsetting thought and what makes that even more compelling to me is the fact that when you think oh this is a woman about to kill herself you're like well of course that's how she's thinking but then when you find out, no, this was a woman doing an act, you just kind of wonder, what is going on in Judy's head that she's able to come up with that kind of a thought, you know? But, oh, but also that she's, like, very willing to take part in this completely insane murder plot and set up this poor idiot who's got the perfect case of vertigo and a fear of heights, which makes him the perfect patsy for a bell tower murder. Um <laughs> specifically well, that's and the movie re- removes itself from that whole murder plot uh keeps that at arm's length enough that towards the end i was going like yeah poor kim novak and then i was like should i be i well, she did do that murder plot i had to keep myself reminding myself of that and then you know i, I still don't well, think but, she deserved and, to accidentally but, fall off the church that way and, no and but I, I think um, that's a great i think that's a great oh, point sean because that is what that 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 you do feel and that's why it is great that we have the, the, the letters that gets you on her side, but also that Stuart stops being sympathetic the minute he meets Judy and starts trying to get her to change her look. Stuart becomes a one-track mind, and you are 
feeling yourself, you know, it's it's strange because you're conflicted. If you did not know that Judy was Madeline, then you would let yourself wholeheartedly go in like, oh, this is terrible how she's being treated. But because you know, there's part of you that feels like, oh, well, this is just, you know, this is how our hero, Jimmy Stewart, is going to figure it out. But also, he's going to figure it out by being an abusive monster to what he thinks is an innocent woman. He passes out of hero territory pretty early after the, well, the fake sec- Kim Novak death. Yeah. Well, well, the second he just decides to like follow some woman into her building and is like, hey, can I like, come in and talk to you just because you remind me of this dead chick? But you're just like, this is fucked up, dude. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah, you, usually that guy's going to start masturbating the next moment, you know, in your hotel room. Tom, don't start giving the dialogue away from your remake just, like, for free on the show. That's... <laughs> shut up. Shut up. Not, the, deal is, the deals is... aren't settled. I haven't gotten Michael Sarah signed on yet, you prick. <laughs> um, when, when he's, like, when all you want is to, we, this woman will be uh, perfect when she when you make her exactly what you want her to be. Um. And if, you know, and if you're Alfred Hitchcock, then afterward you get to discard her because she's an actor. Making women what you want them to be and then discarding them is literally what serial killers do, right? Yeah. I mean, he, he's very, very, very in that vein in the second half of this movie. That, that's what I got was all well, kind of psych- psychosexual uh, uh, murdery vibes. Well, there's a, a what I love about the beginning of the movie and his uh, initial uh, following where he starts following her. You don't realize it until you start thinking about it or you rewatch it a second time. But like she's sitting and she's looking at the painting and she's going to the the cemetery and she's going to the stores or whatever. We're watching him watch her, but we never actually see what her face is like. And if she's if how well she's selling this, how easily he just buys everything that's been placed in front of him. Almost like he wants to because he got a quick look at her and it's just like, yes, she's the one I'm going to latch on to. There's something so deeply perverse about this movie and and this character um, that you really don't see much of at all in the 50s where it's just it is <laughs> no. so twisted like when he when he goes and he's trying to change her and he he shows up at her apartment and he's like you're almost expecting him to like just push her in the room and like murder her and it is so like unhinged and sick and i i you know to go back to the letter scene once again like it, it at least lets you go okay it would be completely unbelievable if this was just some innocent person. She wouldn't be giving him the time of day. Yeah. But because she probably feels that guilt um, and also those feelings for him, it's like, you know, she's putting up with it. But if you if you remove that, if you remove her culpability in that murder or even that that was a factor, I mean, this is just seriously like a perverse story. And it's kind of surprising that it came in the late 50s. And it's funny you mentioned that, Carrie, because to tip my hat to our final you know, thing we'll talk about in a bit, Vertigo was not nominated for Best Picture, but that same year, some of the nominees either attempted to grapple with sexuality or omitted grappling with that, because some of the Best Picture nominees that year include Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, where the play <laughs> is you know, about as explicitly... Uh, homosexuals you could get at the time. They they kind of openly acknowledge what would be the Paul Newman character being in love with another man that is essentially excised from the movie, much to Newman's own frustration. Now, the, another film that probably hasn't been seen, Separate Tables is the Best Picture nominee. Now, Separate Tables is about a bunch of people living in a hotel, and uh, David Niven, who won Best Actor that year, is a quirky, weird gentleman. And then they find out that he had been propositioning women at the cinema, that he would sit down next to women and proposition them, and the whole rest of the film is about the shocking scandal of the Mm -hmm. fact that he had once propositioned women 
They found in a newspaper that in the past he had propositioned women and they felt discomforted and therefore we should call the police and we should evict him from his home. And it's like- Oh man, he was doing the popcorn trick. That's what I thought. (laughs) Yeah, it's like diner. But it is a weird thing where it's like, it, it's it's a strange thing to kind of watch, especially that, you know, a, a 50 film that's so buttoned up that it's just like, oh, well, he did the bad thing. Let's set him on fire, which, you know, say a weird thing. And so you have that and these films that are attempting to, like, touch on sexuality a little bit. Uh, another nominee, Auntie Mame, mentions the word libido and that's it. They just say it in yeah. an abstract sense. So at the time where these are the other kind of movies tackling sexuality, you're right, Carrie, to have this it's, in 58 that yeah. just, you know. There's no, there's no surprise it wasn't a huge fucking hit. Because, I mean, imagine sitting down for the new Jimmy Stewart movie. And, like, <laughs> it, it starts off kind of like this noir where it's like, oh, he's following this dame. What's going on with her? Has she got something going on? Then it becomes like a love story, and it's like, oh no, it's a forbidden love because she's married to his friend. Then she fucking dies, and he goes fucking insane, and you're like, what the fuck is this movie? <laughs> and then it becomes, oh, he's this maniac who just follows women's in- women into their building, and is like, hey, you look like this girl I used to know, and she killed herself in front of me. Can I make you look like her so I could, like, not feel fucking miserable for once? And you're just like, what the fuck? What? Who? No, I don't even ha- like we don't even have TV shows where the married couples can be in the same bed. And I'm seeing yeah. this shit on a Saturday night with my fucking dame. No, absolutely not, sir. And it's also the fact that it, the, the funniest thing about that is, Tom, that's a great point. But then remember that a couple months later, it is followed up with uh, followed up by a Jimmy Stewart, Kim Novak, delightful rom-com. That would be like if six months after Uncut Gems, Idina Menzel was the love interest in Hubie Halloween. Like, (laughs) it's just a weird thing to do to people. It's just like, it's like, yeah, of course. It's not about Jimmy Stewart being old. It's about Jimmy Stewart being a fucking pervo, being this absolute top-tier creep. He should have a fucking position in the cabinet today. Like, what the... (laughs) But what's... And I remember I did... uh, this. Kyle may end up cutting this out, but I did a project in high school. We had to, like... We were assigned um, actors to talk about, uh, you know, for some film history class. And I had gotten assigned Bing Crosby. And I got in trouble for bringing up this fact that I loved, which I found that in a Bing Crosby biography, apparently later in life, Bing Crosby talked about um, how Jimmy Stewart was... Uh, he didn't use the term a pussy, but it was like whatever the equivalent was at the time, uh, because uh, Grace Kelly had apparently wanted to sleep with Jimmy Stewart, and Jimmy Stewart declined because he really was the gentleman that he seemed to be on screen, that he really was just like, that wouldn't, uh, no, we're not married, that wouldn't be the honorable thing. (laughs) And the reason that Bing Crosby would say that is so that he could then transition into saying, Now, when Grace Kelly came to me, I didn't say no, which is just uh, so I went out of my way to bring that up in class and the teacher didn't like it. But that is a thing about that's so fascinating about Stuart, too, is like sometimes when you watch these movies, especially movies about obsession and you have actors in the role playing this weird creep, we end up finding out they're weird creeps. You know, mm-hmm. when you see Mel Gibson shaking the, you know, with the with the gun in his mouth at the beginning of Lethal Weapon, we're like, oh, OK, that's what he is. We find out later <laughs> or really to Kevin Spacey. And I was going to say Kevin Spacey things. But really to talk about a film that also lifts heavily from Vertigo, American Beauty. I mean, the the whole thing with the flower petals during the dream sequence, the Saul Bass dream sequence in this is repurposed as the flower petals in American Beauty, which is another movie about obsession and 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 uh sexual Male impotence yeah and and sexual desire based on inaccessibility um but again with spacey like you know we of course found out oh the reason he plays that so well is that's who he was whereas stewart plays this so well and then you find out no he was a very kind chill person imagine war hero yeah Yeah. imagine imagine jumping out of an airplane in world war ii over fucking france or some <laughs> shit and you see the pilot is fucking jimmy stewart all right boys give him a <laughs> oh, hold down there boys 
I'm pretty sure David Niven is the one who, when he was in the trenches and they were about to like charge out, he turned to them and said, you fellas have it easy. You only have to do this once. I'm going to be doing it every week in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, yeah, but that is it's just fascinating. Um, before I transition us into our final little segment, uh, did either of you guys carry us on? Did you guys have anything else you wanted to add uh, specifically about the film? Is this something I just haven't been clocking in movies uh, from the 50s? Instead of collar stays, Jimmy Stewart seems to be using a, uh, a safety pin to hold his collar together throughout this film. I Anyone honestly, I, I think that what you're dealing with there is that it's one of those things. Truly, uh, I think it's a thing that's sort of lost in translation about men's fashion, which is something you encounter a lot with these films, that there were little codes that you were supposed to pick up on at the time of how a man, you know, looked a little disheveled or didn't conform to what you're supposed to do or had some little screw thing. Like in uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers Swing Time, uh, there is this confounding plot device, like whole like plot thread <laughs> about the length of men's pants. <laughs> this, I'm I'm not I'm not exaggerating. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. Um, at the beginning, it starts out where, like, I think Fred Astaire is supposed to go on stage or get married or something, but he gets the pants back from the tailor, and his pants are too short. Okay, you brush that off as a one-off thing. Then, the whole thing is about Fred Astaire trying to win Ginger Rogers away from some guy. Well, the guy's about to marry Ginger Rogers, and what does Fred Astaire and his friends do? They get a hold of the guy's pants. He walks out, his pants are too short, and he just sort of shrugs, and it's like, I guess I can't marry this woman. And I... <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea what that is. It's how, how short were the pants? Were they like shorts? No, no, <laughs> they were just like Millhouse's flood pants. Like and it's it's very weird, but it is a thing, and we've talked about it with the show a lot, which is like certain things that get lost in translation. Certain things that, for an audience at the time, they would go like that would that would totally click with them, but. It's not going, it doesn't read now. And I'm sure that that's true of, there are plenty, I'm sure there are plenty of things that in movies from the 80s and 90s that we watch now, like there's certain little obvious visual cues that someday, if any of us uh, have children, we'll be showing them to our kids and they just will not get what they're supposed to get from that. You know, that's what we're dealing with there in that idea is it's supposed to convey something that would be very obvious <laughs> to 50s <laughs> audiences or it might just be as obvious as they didn't think people would be re-watching this shit in crystal clear high def so it was just <laughs> there to like hold his suit together or whatever oh and now it, we're it, like it, looking at every scene multiple shirts multiple suits he's holding this thing together with a yeah. clothes with a safe can i just confirm tom as sure. as much as i believe that in most movies there is no world where i believe that edith head the inspiration <laughs> for edna mode would have tolerated safety pins if that was not an intention. There's no <laughs> world. Do you think Alfred Hitchcock's gonna let a woman tell him what to do on the set of a movie? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's probably what Mike said. I don't know. I mean, it, it's... Who knows? I, I, I dress like an absolute goon half the time, so I couldn't begin to fucking tell you about <laughs> men's fashion in the 50s, let alone today, so, you know. Tom, you write for a men's magazine and have regular articles on men's fashion yeah that's not my problem that's the people reading <laughs> my do what i say now that i do I just, that's not my I just, problem and i'm i'm not doing that as a bit that dawned on me as you were saying it because you're like yeah what the fuck do i know about men's fashion i'm like right right you write for a men's magazine <laughs> i i didn't hire me <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> So uh, there's one thing, yeah. um, well, there's just two points I want to make before we uh, wrap this thing up. One is the change from the book of the locations uh, to San Francisco was not an arbitrary one. Hitchcock mentioned, talks about how he wanted to change it to San Francisco because he wanted the hilly uh, terrain to make it that, to emphasize the emotional instability of uh, Scotty, not just because of him being an absolute fucking maniac, but also that he has vertigo and he has fear of heights. So this this city he lives in where he's constantly going up and down and up and down is just like, oh, it's no wonder this guy lost his fucking mind. He's 
he's got vertigo and he lives in San Francisco of all goddamn places. Yeah, the only thing worse would be if he was in New York City working in a skyscraper. Yeah, and even then, I'm sure he'd probably just, like, throw a hissy fit, throw some blonde out the window and have been arrested <laughs> by the time he was, like, 22. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also just wanted to make a point, because Mike said something earlier about how this isn't a movie so much about the story, but I do interestingly think that this movie is a, is a movie about stories in a way that Hitchcock doesn't always really focus on. I think... So much of this movie is a subversion of, one, the noir tropes, and two, love story tropes. But it's all about, in this the self-effacing way that he's having Jimmy Stewart pretty much stand in for him. It's about a guy who falls so easily for such a well-crafted and, to his mind, believable story that he spends what we will have to assume is the rest of his life obsessed with this tale and i think that's not too dissimilar to what it's like to be a filmmaker that you become so immersed and so obsessed with these with a perfect story that you're constantly chasing it and um as much as psycho is my favorite hitchcock movie i think this might have actually been maybe the best movie that could have been the end of his career like this would have been the perfect final movie the same way The Irishman should be Scorsese's last movie, he's probably going to keep making some, and we'll just be like, yeah, they were great. Should have stopped with The Irishman, buddy. Tom, I'm sorry, you don't think that the Bruce Dern-led family plots is the best way for Hitchcock to, to conclude his career? Well, listen, I'm always a fan of when filmmakers, iconic filmmakers, work with your father, but... <laughs> da- Tom thinks my dad looks like Bruce Dern, so... that's Old that Bruce Dern. Like, I think his dad is going to age into what Bruce Stern looks like in Nebraska. Just this crazy old kook walking around uh, Long Island. I gotta go to the toy fair. So, uh, I already touched on this, but Vertigo was not nominated for Best Picture that year. Uh, the nominees for Best Picture the year Vertigo was released were Auntie Mame, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, The Defiant Ones, Separate Tables, and the winner, Gigi. Gigi is we we have Gigi coming up on a future season and uh the goal of this show is for us to watch these films and find why they have value Gigi sticks out in my mind for an uphill battle for me but <laughs> could be worse it could be Auntie Mame I oh Gigi. yeah Auntie Mame is not uh Auntie, Auntie Mame is weird I, have you seen it I was, I was in a sixth grade production of Mame <laughs> Auntie Mame is am I, Auntie am I Mame the only person that wasn't a fucking theater kid in this goddamn thing? What the hell? I, I did right. two, I did one in sixth grade and one my senior year of high school. I wasn't really a theater. Now, Sean, when you guys did Auntie Mame, did you realize very quickly this was the story about uh, a delightful little gay boy and his abusive aunt? <laughs> um, no, but it was cast that way. Auntie, I'm going to pick out the loveliest dresses for you for when you're hungover the next day. What a fun time. So... Uh, Vertigo was nominated for only two Oscars. It was nominated for Best Sound, which it lost to South Pacific, and nominated for Best Art Direction, which it lost to Gigi. Listen, it lost, at least it lost, admittedly, at least it lost Best uh, Sound to a Musical, I guess. I mean, obviously it deserved so much more than that, um... I mean the score. Like, what are they? What are they thinking? Cinematography. This yeah. is one of the best looking movies ever, man. Yeah, give Jimmy Stewart a give me. We'll give Jimmy Stewart every time he gets on screen. A, a, a See, I topic. will say this. I was I was not like hardcore in like oh absolutely nominate Stewart, but I think it, Kim Novak was such an obvious like should have gotten nominated for this goddamn thing. Well, who um, won Best Actress? It was uh, well one. I can actually say. Uh, was, you know, understandable. Best Actress went to Susan Hayward for a movie called I Want to Live, which uh, I will say, Tom, you would fucking love. It's a brutal movie. It's a it's a 50s noir based on the true story of a woman who was framed for a murder and uh, put on death row. You got me um, brutal. Can I... Slight spoilers for this 50-year-old film. The main reason it's brutal is uh, she's falsely accused, put on death row, and the movie ends with us watching her die. Hell yeah. It's literally just she's blindfolded, led into the gas chambers, 
and then we just watch Susan Hayward gasp for breath and die. Hell yeah, some Green Mile shit. Give it to me now. It's, it's, <laughs> it is so much darker than the Green Mile. I even, <laughs> yes, even that scene. Um, But there are nominees in there, like, I, for Best Actress, uh, Rosalind Russell for Antime, I understand, is big, but, like, Deborah Kerr in Separate Tables. Deborah Kerr has nothing to do in Separate Tables. Separate Tables is a dumb... G- give Kim Novak a goddamn nomination for this thing. Are you kidding me? Separate Table sounds like the name of a movie like a sketch show would make up to make fun of like an Oscar movie. <laughs> we're, 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 we're about to sit down for Separate Tables. It's, yeah, I, it's another one that I do. Uh, separate Tables, I do not anticipate us ever having to talk about as an episode of this show. I'll put it that way. Now, interestingly enough, I do want to note Hitchcock, despite being considered one of the fundamental filmmakers, somebody that we all... I think we all knew Alfred Hitchcock growing up, even if we hadn't seen his films, because he was, especially in the 90s, like such a quintessential concept. You know, he's one of the few director's names that we all grew up knowing. If you were a kid and you went to Universal Studios in Florida, they had an Alfred Hitchcock uh, attraction that was all themed around his movies. Very weird. But Hitchcock only ever got four Best Picture nominations. And none of them are the movies that people associate with Hitchcock today, unless you're like a big film fan. You know, like people, when you think of Hitchcock, people go to Rear Window, Vertigo, Psycho. No, he got two Best Picture nominees in 1940, which were Foreign Correspondent and Rebecca, the latter of which won. Uh, Then Suspicion in 1941, which is a not great film, uh, and (laughs) lost to How Green Was My Valley. And then the last Best Picture nominee he gets is Spellbound in 1945, uh, which loses The Lost Weekend. Do we chalk that up to just genre pictures not getting respect at award shows? I think that's a large part of it. I also think that there's probably something to the fact that Hitchcock, look, he made a lot of movies. Um <laughs> And and a bunch of them got nominations, just not necessarily Best Picture. And I can I can understand how, in the minds of people then, there was a bit of fatigue in the same way that some people... I mean, it, it did get a Best Picture nomination, but there were a lot of people when Wolf of Wall Street came out that wrote it off as just another Scorsese, you know, gangster movie, or The Irishman got written off that way by some people. When they're alive and making work, we take some filmmakers for granted. In 20 years, 30 years... The next crop of little film nerds in college are going to be sitting down and going, how in the hell did Sully not get like 90 nominations? And we'll all just be sitting back going, I don't know. At the time, we were just like, look, it's what Clint Eastwood does. And they go, yeah, makes good movies. And we're like, yeah, I, I guess. I don't know. Hell yeah, Sully, we here. We stand a king. <laughs> I think it's I think it's a little bit of that. I think it's mainly the genre thing because he does shift more into a more populist uh, blockbuster style. I mean, there's a reason why he does North by Northwest after this. It's like a rebound thing. We're f- at, at this point, we're four years out from the Truffaut book, which really recontextualizes Hitchcock as a filmmaker. But by that point, he's on a downswing. No matter how much you recontextualize the guy, nobody's going to fucking rip the walls down of the Academy for not nominating Marnie or fucking Family Plot. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it was a little bit of a too little too late uh take bringing him back into everyone being like yeah hitchcock does rock and and what's wild what's wild too is he does get nominated for best director more times so he gets a best director nomination for weird window and he gets a one for psycho i think that's just one of the i think it's that sort of like eh, we'll give them this little nomination thing but we won't say they made one of the best pictures of the year well, it's like, um, uh, I mean, to, to, to bring it to somebody else who's uh, known for a lot of thrillers, uh, David Lynch got a Best Director nomination for Blue Velvet, but they didn't nominate it for Best Picture. Yeah, because it was a dirty fucking creepo, creepo movie. <laughs> and I think also Hitchcock just became more and more of an enigma and a personality. And especially with something like Psycho, where, you know, you see those famous clips of him being like, he'll you know die of fright or whatever and he's doing alfred hitchcock presents and stuff like that i think him as a personality almost started to eclipse his movies in the eyes of 
you know, the Academy in Hollywood. They probably uh. saw him a bit like William Castle. Like he was, he was this huckster guy. He was, he would just right. be like, oh, he's just selling you the newest thing to get, to get those idiot kids into the theaters on the weekends. After like people weren't, you know, you could watch Rebecca and go, oh, this is a good filmmaker. But then by the time he's wandering around just with his fucking Oh, and this something terrible happened in this house that was so terrible we can't even imagine it. Let <laughs> go inside. And you're just like, what? This guy? What? I want to just watch a movie, guys. Stop talking to me. Like, you... <laughs> all right. Yeah, um... and he's making a TV. He's he's a TV guy. Which at, at no, like genuinely at the time you did not do both. So Hollywood must have been like. Oh, this fucking idiot who makes TV shows now! Get get out of here. We'll give you a little. We'll give you this little thing because a lot of people saw it, but you're not a best picture material anymore. Yeah, but I thought not a lot of people saw it. Yeah. Uh, now, now, Sean. Um, just as we wrap up, um, thus far, Tom, myself, and Carrie have all done Alfred Hitchcock impressions that in no way sound like Alfred Hitchcock. So before we wrap up, <laughs> I wanted to give you your opportunity. Would you like to do a bad Alfred Hitchcock impression? I don't think this sounds like Alfred Hitchcock. Ew. That was, <laughs> ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Maurice LaMarche is in the building. Um, <laughs> I could hear the jowls. In he, that. Well, yeah, I tried to make it jowly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sean and Gary, thank you guys so much for coming on for this. The fact that you agreed to do this uh, at all is, is great. The fact that you agreed to do this during what is a very hectic time for you, probably. Um, it's a busy week. I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah, you know, you guys. <laughs> in a way, uh, I, I guess what we'll say is this is uh, both a podcast and uh, Carrie. This is me and Tom throwing you a bachelorette party, and Sean. This is us throwing you a bachelor party. This is what we've done. That's oh, what great. this podcast it, is. Uh, thank you very much. I'll get out of here so you can bring in the Chippendales or whatever it is. No, that's that's and and <laughs> Chippendale. Oh, the Rescue Rangers. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, well, now I know that I have to very carefully measure Sean's suit before we get married <laughs> to make sure it's not too short or else I'm not marrying him. Oh, boy. Sway and, and the thing is, like, that's there's so many weird things about Swing Time, which is another movie we'll have to cover at some point. <laughs> um, I would say, I would say, hey, you guys should come back for Swing Time, but that's a movie that has blackface, so you don't want to do that. Um, yeah. Don't want to be on for that one. Well... Blackface is scary. <laughs> but thank you for coming on for this one. And you guys are welcome back anytime. I also want to make sure people do check out Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie, which they can find at www.ain'titscary.com or on any of your podcast apps or on social media at Ain't It Scary. If you guys follow us, you will see us retweeting them and, and, and vice versa. Uh, mm -hmm. But Carrie and Sean, thank you guys so much for coming on. We really appreciate it uh, for, for joining us for this film. What a joy. It was great. Yeah, it felt like being back in uh, film class with you guys. You two yelling at each other and me just chuckling in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a time machine of you it logging really on for the first time. Like when I could hear you as I'm ranting and I just hear you chuckling in the background. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, she she's she hasn't heard this bullshit in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, just you guys yelling about Hitchcock. Hitchcock's um, a thief. <laughs> Koshal said Hitchcock's a thief and just me giggling to myself as a it war was, breaks out it was 2011 all over again <laughs> so similar to Sean uh, this was actually my first time seeing Vertigo as well I haven't had a lot of exposure to Hitchcock in general I think the first time I was ever exposed to him was I want to say like middle school, maybe like eighth grade, seventh grade. We had to watch The Birds. Um, I remember that film being, um, I remember liking it when I originally saw it. And then when we revisited it for our sort of mock episode, um, finding myself gravitating more towards the cinematography than the story, very similar to Vertigo. I saw both of them were the 4K restorations, which I think hold up really freaking well i don't know what they had to do in order to restore those but they're, they're they look really great um now kyle that may have been your first exposure to vertigo uh the hitchcock film but when was the first time you heard the song vertigo by the band u2 off the 2004 grammy winning album how to dismantle an atomic bomb god i got i don't know i feel like i was probably in my dad's car he would have been driving a 
maybe a 2000 and maybe like a 1999 Ford Taurus, maybe like a red Taurus. I don't know. It, it was one of those things where that album came out and suddenly my parents were YouTube fans. It's like, I've never once heard you mention Bono in, in my entire life until now. Yeah, 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 yeah. As we wrap up here, gentlemen, what would you uh, add to the registry for our listeners? Again, the rules state that it needs to be an American film and at least 10 years old to be uh, considered. So I had a couple things that I was tossing around. I mean, obviously, when it comes to Alfred Hitchcock, there's so many different connections in so many different directions. Um, You know, of course, a number of his films, as we discussed in the episode, are in the registry. And I could certainly have picked another Hitchcock film to go in. And there are so many directors who are influenced by him. Uh, you know, Brian De Palma is the example everybody goes to because he, you know, was, was such a fan. But the people like Peter Bogdanovich have, have, have had elements of him. You know, everybody's been to some degree or another. Christopher Nolan, so on and so forth. But it struck me when I was watching Vertigo and we got to the end and Jimmy Stewart chasing uh, Kim Novak up there. and it struck me that of course that imagery is reused another film that i love and a film that most people don't think of when they think of influenced by vertigo or influenced by hitchcock because of all the filmmakers who have been who have drawn influence from hitchcock this guy never comes up and it's a filmmaker who has had a lot of notable films who sort of maybe has had his own hitchcock hitchcockian uh decline um recently but has had a lot of notable films. Uh, he is undeniably a distinct auteur, uh, even if in a lot of cases he's Baby's first auteur because of how obvious his motifs are. Um, but I feel like when we talk about filmmakers who are influenced by Hitchcock, uh, Tim Burton is never part of the conversation, and he should be, because that you know that clock tower thing from Vert- that clock tower sequence from Vertigo, bell tower. Why am I saying clock tower? The bell tower sequence, cathedral sequence from Vertigo with the stairs, the chase up. Uh, While it's been copied a dozen times, it was uh, homage at the end of the film. I think should be in the registry. Hugely influential film, which is Batman from 1989. Tim Burton's Batman, which took a comic book character that was known as a joke uh, after the Adam West series and infused it with this real sense of paranoia. And this grandiosity uh, in the same way that Hitchcock did with Vertigo. Hitchcock acknowledged when he was talking to Francois Truffaut that he was less interested in the story than he was in what it all was visually and what it all came out to be visually. And uh, the Burton Batman does that. It is about what you feel and what it is visually. On paper, the idea that Jack Napier killed Bruce Wayne's parents and all that. It's, it's, you know, on paper, it's silly. And story-wise, it's silly. And there's a lot of stuff in that film that story-wise is kind of nonsense if you're just looking at the black and white of it on paper. But it's the ambiance and the tone and the, the absolute chaos and paranoia that he brings into, you know, Batman Returns as well. But I, I think the, the fact that it is a film that was a commercial hit that is deeply indebted to Vertigo without ever doing the overwrought, you know, blonde brunette thing that is copied in, you know, a thousand other films. It's, it's probably the clo- one that gets closest to the heart of the tone of Vertigo without trying to copy specific elements of it. So I believe for that and for obviously its impact on popular culture and the fact that it's just a, a brilliantly constructed film uh, and an iconic film, I think that Tim Burton's Batman should be in the National Film Registry. Yes, I mean, with me, it could have been very easy to go with the Palma. It's obvious. I mean, uh, he's made so many movies that are just repackages of Hitchcock movies. Uh, and, you know, they're all, I mean, most of them are all pretty great, and I like them. Um, uh, Obsession is literally just Vertigo with. The Palma's technical craft and Paul Schrader's own specific sexual peccadillos, uh, you know, aka there's some incest involved. Um, but I wanted to do something different. I wanted, I, I, I didn't want to go for the obvious of just someone aping him, and you know, you know, all these big elaborate set pieces and the, 
all that and the bright colors. I don't know. I, I wanted to go something a little different. And it hit me. There's a filmmaker, I think, is very obviously inspired by Hitchcock, even though you might not think of it otherwise. You might not immediately think, oh, Hitchcock and this guy are of a same mind. But I think they are. This guy does it in his own unique, deranged sensibilities. Uh, there is... This movie is very much about uh, the sexual desires of an older man towards a younger blonde and the ways that deranged, perverted love story is a lot more obviously bad. It's good and evil literalized. It's got all of the technical craft, the, the bright colors, the unreality of like how Hitchcock clearly is filming on sets and he's using that to add a sense of unreality to his stuff. And this filmmaker does his own thing with the unreality. There's the blonde brunette dichotomy that Hitchcock loves dealing with. And this filmmaker has done so too. Um, I think Twin Peaks Firewalk with me is very clearly David Lynch working in a vertigo sandbox. He is prequelizing his landmark TV show, saying goodbye to the character he created and whose death kickstarted the show, giving her a goodbye. And what I do think is very vertigo, where instead of it being this noir thing where there's a detective and he falls for his target and all of this, it's uh you know typically david lynch insanity of an ancient evil is cracked open and possesses a man and decides to have that man start a long and torturous sexual relationship with that man's daughter destroying her mind and sending her down a deep dark path where her own identity is unsure uh, of is uncertain to even herself leading to her demise and leading to, at least in the show, the father's demise and then this ancient evil's demise later in The the Return. Uh, I think David Lynch has always been working within classic cinema and twisting it and perverting it and getting to the deeper, seedier underbelly that Hitchcock could only subtly hint at without getting too deep into the disgusting nature of these stories similar to what the Palmer does, but I think Lynch really gets to it here. And Twin Peaks Firewalk at me, I think uh, should, I mean, Lynch should have most of his movies in Land Empire, not uh, withstanding, uh, should have all of his movies in here. And I think pairing it up with Vertigo, Twin Peaks Firewalk with me makes a shit ton of sense. I think it's one of his best movies. It's maybe my favorite, if not wild at heart, Twin Peaks Firewalk with me is, I think a landmark movie in that man's career. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Sean and Carrie McCabe for joining us. You can check out their podcast, Ain't It Scary, with Sean and Carrie, wherever you get your podcasts, and follow their show on social media at Ain't It Scary. You can also follow our co-hosts on social media as well. You can find Mike at NKOAS and Tom at Raging Bull 1990. While you're there, be sure to follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at YMO Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone who you think would make a great guest for an upcoming film, tell us about it at yourmissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time.